Hello everyone, we'll just give everyone a moment to join and get their audio connected. Make sure that everyone can hear us. <laughs> Wonderful. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Gemma, I represent Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba and I will be the moderator for this session. First, I'd like to acknowledge this session is being broadcast from Treaty 1 territory, the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Nahia, the Oji Cree, the Dakota and the Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Much of our food for local consumption and export is grown on Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 territory. Our drinking water comes from Treaty 3 territory and our hydropower comes from and through Treaty 1, 2, 3 and 5 territory, enabling us to be here with you virtually today. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few basic housekeeping items. This session is being recorded by NEM Ontario and will be posted on their public YouTube channel. Before we end this session, there will be a very short poll question put on the screen. So please do stick around to the very end so that we can get your feedback about this session. After today's presentation, Grant will do a short question and answer session. So please do feel free to send us questions at any time during this presentation using the chat function that you can see on your screen. If you're joining us on a mobile device, that chat function may be under the three dots or under more, so do go and have a look for it. It's now my great pleasure to welcome our presenter today, Grant Koropatnik, who will be speaking on the topic of professionalism in engineering. Grant has been CEO and Registrar of Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba since 2006. Engineers Geoscience Manitoba administers the Engineering and Geoscientific Professions Act by licensing professional engineers and geoscientists and setting standards for and regulating these professions in Manitoba so that the public interest is served and protected. Grant is a graduate civil engineer with a certificate in human resource management from the University of Manitoba and has been a member of our association since 1992. Grant, thank you so much for joining us today. It's over to you. Thank you so much, Gemma. It's uh, my pleasure to do this and good morning to everyone. Uh, also, I should say good afternoon to our uh, friends in Eastern Canada. And I suppose I should also say uh, welcome uh, to all of our friends around the world internationally because we know through the uh, technology uh, of online video meetings and the internet, uh, there may be some of you in an international time zone. So uh, welcome to all. It's my pleasure to do this session uh, today. I don't know what, uh, what you've got in your region of the country, but it's brilliant sunshine here in Winnipeg. And it looks like we have an early spring and uh, uh, I have a small lake behind my home and the geese are out there today and uh, there's lots of them. So you know what that means. Uh, there will be exponential growth of those little uh, baby geese uh, this summer. So my yard is going to be chewed up real good from all those geese. At any rate, uh, welcome to our session today. Allow me to just uh, get my slide presentation up in front of you here. There we go. So we're going to be talking about professionalism in engineering. And uh, I really enjoy this topic. I've given this presentation a few times and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it as well. Here's our outline. Of course, we're going to try to answer the question, what is professionalism? That's what we're here for. But as we do that, we're going, we're going to be looking at some of the history of the professions and of uh, the engineering profession. And of course, uh, we have to look at legislative authority and discuss uh, how the professions fit into uh, legislation or the laws of the land uh, in the region where we practice. I'm also going to talk about the profession today, just some things that I think will be familiar to you but uh, it's important to consider 
as we look at this overall question of what is professionalism. And at times I might hit the gas pedal pretty hard and, and go by some slides quickly uh, in order to save some time at the end for questions and answers. Hope to have a good amount of time uh, for any questions that you have. Uh, so uh, forgive me if I, I, I go by a slide that you'd like to pause on and discuss more of. Uh, my email address is at the end. If any of you would like to send me an email, I would be uh, honored uh, uh, to receive it and also to uh, answer your questions that you might have after the session. If I'm on target with my slides and, uh, and my, my uh, notes, I think we'll, we'll be done in about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, certainly all we have is an hour, but I hope to uh, uh, finish a little bit early with the, the content for your questions. So Jim has already told you a little bit about me, but here's my introductory slide. Um, it's uh, true, I really am an engineer. I'm a proud graduate of the Price Faculty of Engineering at the University of Manitoba. And uh, I think the slide shows you, yeah, it says I'm a grad from 1983. So you know what uh, generation I'm from. Uh, born in the 60s, product of the 70s. If we wanna do some rock and roll trivia, uh, I got, the, got it covered, I think I'm gonna win but uh, certainly uh, 70s rock and roll. Uh, but that's a little bit about me. Uh, once more, I'm honored to do this session for you today. And uh, I'd like to begin with this quote. It helps us establish our place uh, in the overall scheme of things. Of course, we're engineers practicing in, in our uh, jobs in our part of Canada or perhaps somewhere else. Uh, and so we gotta fit in. But I like this quote, let me read it for you. We are part of an historic, honorable profession. It was here long before us and it will be here long after we're gone. I like to begin with this just to say that we have great influence as engineers. However, our influence is a thin slice of history in the overall broad spectrum of history, uh, millennia, thousands and thousands of years of world history, we get to occupy a thin slice. What we do uh, at times might seem quite insignificant when we look at overall history, but really it is important because engineers have influenced societies around the world down through world history. And that's what we're doing here today in our own time. So. I'm a little bit uh, uh, later on in my career. Some of you might be just starting your careers. Uh, many of you will be uh, active and uh, right in the middle of your career. Uh, just let's remember that we're having our influence in our own small period of time, but this profession was here long before us and uh, with our hard work, it will continue on long after we're gone. So there's our question that we're gonna to answer today. What is professionalism? What does it mean to be a professional? Um, when I do this, broad, this uh, session in uh, a lecture theater, I, do it, so I had been doing it pre-pandemic about four times a year for students at the University of Manitoba. Uh, I would just say, hey, just shout it out. What do you think professionalism is? Just shout it out. Well, we're not gonna do that here because uh, you'll fill up that chat and I'll get all confused by trying to read what you think it is. But uh, it's fascinating to hear that uh, the definition of professionalism is all over the map, certainly among students, uh, but I'll say just in general among uh, the public, if you ask them, what is a professional, you get a wide range of answers. Uh, I'm gonna use an example that I think will be familiar to most of us. Uh, if you follow hockey, certainly if you were uh, uh, raised in Canada, uh, maybe even played some hockey, uh, it's a part of our culture. I want to ask you as we begin, are NHL hockey players professionals? The word professional gets tagged on to many occupations, but I'm gonna pick on NHL hockey players um, and uh, uh, well, we'll explain in a moment. 
The term professional got applied to anyone who is paid to play, sing, write, act, perform, etc. Some type of occupation, you'll see it. Uh, about 40, 50 years back, I'm thinking of in my youth, uh, in the realm of sport, Olympic athletes playing for their country weren't paid to do so. They actually had to volunteer and, and raise their own money. They were called amateur athletes and uh, compared to those who were in a, a, an organized league like the NHL, the Canadian Football League, National Football League, uh, Major League Baseball, uh, those athletes were paid to uh, perform or to uh, participate in their sport. Amateur athletes volunteered for their countries in the Olympic Games. The term professional got applied to athletes who were paid to play and that those individuals were no longer considered amateurs. Now, I think the term has been incorrectly applied. A more accurate title might be athletic entertainment worker, because that's exactly what they do. They have a job to do and uh, it's entertainment and it's part of athletics. Now it could also be part of uh, the musical world being a singer, a, a, a performer playing an instrument in a symphony orchestra. You might be a writer who, who is a very accomplished uh, writer. Uh, the word professional gets tagged in front of many occupations. But I would like to just uh, tease you a little bit and say, when we talk about professional hockey players, is there any ethical conduct out there on the hockey ice? Okay, well, be thinking of that. We're gonna move forward to define what is professionalism and what is a professional, but I want you to, to uh, work with me on this. Uh, think of someone who you follow. You might follow them on, on Twitter, Instagram, uh, you know, all of the various platforms that are out there in social media, uh, but think of someone who you follow. It might be an athlete, it might be a rock and roll star, musician, it might be a Hollywood actor, uh, could be a great world performer, uh, you know, uh, of a musical instrument, the violin, cello, uh, one of these uh, high level performers could be a writer, someone who you really love uh, reading their, their books. Think of that person. We're going to measure them against six criteria to define professionalism. That's coming up in a few more slides, but you got to think of someone, uh, if it's an NHL hockey player, uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm thinking of the captain of the Winnipeg Jets, Blake Wheeler. And so I'm going to measure Blake against our six criteria in a moment. It's sometimes helpful when you consider a topic to consider what it is not. Uh, so let's, uh, let's, let's try and do that with uh, professionalism. It's very clear that uh, we don't want it to be an attitude of I'm better than you. Uh, sometimes our proud heritage and our strong education leads us to a place of arrogance. Uh, let's don't go there. Uh, that doesn't look good for us as engineers, uh, certainly doesn't look good. Uh, I don't think it's a, a quality of professionalism. Let's at all times be respectful of others uh, as we uh, conduct our professional practice. Uh, Another thing that it, professionalism is not, it's not uh, white collar versus blue collar. Obviously there are different employment groups uh, within um, uh, the workplace, uh, certainly within engineering, or I'll say the manufacturing context, the engineers generally are in the office and uh, do the designs and all the meetings up in the office, but they go down to the shop floor where our designs are actually implemented in the form of a manufactured product. And so it's easy to think that maybe our status is somehow more important because we uh, come up with the ideas, we design them, we put them into uh, uh, drawings the, that go down uh, to a, the shop floor where the workers uh, manufacture those goods or lab workers uh, work a process in a lab or some other work context. Uh, really, no one person is more important than the other we need all these people to uh, do our engineering. So let's don't get trapped into thinking that the shop floor workers somehow don't have uh, as good or as high a status as we have as engineers. That's just not professional. Lastly, it's important to 
point out that a profession is not a craft, trade, guild, or union. Uh, you can look up the definitions of those four groups, but a profession is distinct from those other four. Uh, important distinction uh, needs to be made, of course, when we talk about the word professional being tagged on in front of occupations. It sometimes also gets tagged on in front of uh, organizations, yet those organizations may not, in fact, be a profession or may not even be a group associated with professionals. But I'll give an example of one. There's a, a group called the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada. Uh, some of our participants in this session today may be a part of that, that group. It is a labor union and uh, they have a collective bargaining contract with federal uh, departments or with the federal government. These are doctors, lawyers, nurses, accountants, architects, engineers, and other professionals organized into a labor union. But there's an important distinction. Although I suppose you would say that they have the right to use the word professional because they are um, a person working in a profession, albeit they're organized into a union group. The important distinction is, is that that particular organization is governed under the Labor Relations Act. That's what it's called in Manitoba. It may be called something slightly different, but they will be organized under a piece of labor legislation, whereas a profession, uh, Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba, Professional Engineers Ontario, um, you know, uh, Engineers Geoscientists British Columbia, all of the regulators only exist because of a piece of distinct professional legislation. And so different than a union group in that respect, but uh, it's important to point out that, that uh, the profession is not one of those uh, four groups. In European and Western history, places of higher learning were monasteries and seminaries run by the church and various religious orders. And you might say, well, what's this got to do with engineering? <laughs> well, that was exactly my thought when I began to research this uh, session about five years ago. I was fascinated to know the origins of the word professional. So uh, bear with me here. Of course, the church controlled the printed word way back in world history. We're, we're talking about, uh, you know, 500, 600 years ago. And uh, so if uh, they were able to control the word, educating others was uh, something that I guess only the church could do or was primarily done by these monasteries, seminaries, and colleges that were based in the church. Vocation is a strong feeling of being destined or called to undertake a specific type of work, especially a sense of being chosen by God for religious work or a religious life. Now you might feel uh, that, that you've been called to be an engineer. Uh, I'm from a proud uh, family of engineers. My dad and all my uncles are all engineers. I actually even have a geoscientist in the family tree. And uh, I've got uh, uh, a nephew who's uh, also become an engineer. So lots of engineers. In, in my life and, and, and around me. Uh, and, and some would say they feel called to be an engineer. Well, way back when, uh, when all of this was uh, uh, taking place about 500 years ago, those who were studying in these institutions, they were referred to as disciples and novices. And any students in these institutions would take a vow or a profession of faith. Anyone in one of these institutions were, were referred to as professionals upon graduation. So roll the history forward to today and the graduates of the Price Faculty of Engineering at University of Manitoba are known as professionals. And you could say, well, they're known as professionals because they profess what they know in the uh, area of study called applied science or engineering. It's not a religious life. Um, it's not uh, studying uh, scriptures or holy writings or any of those things, which the professionals years and centuries ago were doing. 
we're professing what we know in engineering. So that's how we get the word professional. I found it quite interesting. Now, I'd like to ask you, what are the five founding professions of world history? The five founding professions of world history. Obviously, one of them is engineering, so uh, you got four more to go. Anybody uh, can, can uh, think of these, uh, can guess what they are. Uh, they should be pretty easy. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move along. The obvious one that most get, I see in the chat, uh, doctors, of course, yes. Medical practice is one of the, fine, the founding professions of world history. Uh, another one, uh, uh, lawyers, of course, yes. Uh, legal practice. And uh, I see in the chat, someone's nailed the one that no one gets. Okay, so you, you hang on for me, work with me on this one. The next one, I'll say the third one, it's a lot like uh, engineering. Anybody guess what that one is? A lot like engineering, but considered one of the founding professions of world history. Architecture. Okay, well, and, uh, and thanks to, uh, to, to uh, is it Miriam? Who, who nailed the last one, which is accounting. Yes, accounting practice. And you know what they were uh, centuries, uh, millennia ago. In fact, I'll say uh, the accounting uh, profession is perhaps the oldest profession in, in world history um, because they've been collecting taxes from us since the beginning of time. And uh, so accounting is in fact the uh, fifth a profession of the five founding professions of world history. So engineering is one of, the, one of them. We can be proud of it. We've helped build societies all over the world since the beginning of time. So here's our six criteria which help define a profession. And all professions follow this general list. So. Uh, uh, if you're still thinking of some of the other ones, uh, they should pass these six criteria easily. But I'm going to ask you to think of your person that you're following and begin to measure them against these six things. Okay, I'm thinking of uh, NHL hockey player Blake Wheeler. And uh, so I'm going to measure Blake against uh, these. Uh, you measure your person as we go along. Uh, let's begin. So the first criteria is uh, integrity and trustworthiness. Now I've heard and seen uh, Blake Wheeler interviewed many times uh, before the hockey game, after the hockey game. I actually had the pleasure of meeting him once in person. I, uh, my, uh, I have his jersey. When I go to a hockey game, I wear his, uh, his jersey. Uh, he autographed it for me one time. And uh, of course I haven't been going to a hockey game for, for a long time. Um, but when we did go, um, we, we always wear our home team jersey. And uh, I know that uh, having met him once and but heard him interviewed many times, he just strikes me as being a good person, a real fine fellow. And uh, I know he's got uh, a beautiful family, raising kids, and uh, he's a good, good uh, hockey player from Minnesota. Uh, I'll say he gets a check mark for number one. Now, a professional is educated in a specialized body of knowledge. That's uh, criteria number two. And although uh, high level hockey, uh, you don't go to school for that. You really have to know the game well. And I'll say that uh, uh, my, my person, Blake Wheeler, gets a check mark for being educated uh, at a very high level about the game of hockey. So I'll give him that one. Number three is standards of entry. Well, if you know uh, high level hockey in, in uh, Canada, the US, around the world, you got to start when uh, you're about three years old, you got to learn to skate and then you move up through all the levels and at each level there's a standard. And if you don't pass that standard, you don't progress. And in order to play at a very high level, like the NHL, uh, you have to pass all the standards of entry into that occupation. So I'm going to say, my example gets a check mark for number three. Uh, number four, it gets a little trickier. Uh, maybe your person has got three for three so far, uh, but number four becomes a little trickier. Uh, and I'll just uh, start with, uh, again, NHL hockey players. 
uh, if they if they do something really terrible out there on the on the ice during the game, let's just say uh, a player takes his hockey stick with two hands and 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 uh, slashes another hockey player across the helmet, across the head. Well, that's going to get that player kicked out of the game uh, because you've risked a terrible injury to another player. And the disciplinary protocols, you're going to meet the vice president of discipline for the National Hockey League, and you're likely going to get games uh, suspended from a bunch of games. You're likely going to get a fine. So you could say that for NHL hockey players, there, there are disciplinary protocols. So I give a check mark to my example again. So four for four. Uh, how about yours? Four for four? Maybe. Now, if you look at some of the other occupations, let's look at uh, Hollywood actors. Uh, they do something terrible. Is there a group that disciplines them? Are there a set of disciplinary protocols in place for musicians, rock and roll stars, um, plumbers, electricians, others? You have to look carefully because many times there are no disciplinary protocols in place. Um, so uh, maybe your person falls off at number four. This is where it gets uh, more critical. Number five, code of ethics. Of course, uh, in the uh, professions uh, and in specifically in engineering, we have uh, all these standards of entry, disciplinary protocols. We also have a code of ethics. That's a statement about good professional practice and good conduct or good behavior. And so we easily qualify as a profession. Uh, what about your person? Uh, if they're not an engineer, uh, but some other occupation, is there a code of ethics in place? I'm thinking of uh, journalists. I believe there's a journalistic code of ethics about what they uh, are to do, how to conduct themselves. So. So you might argue that a journalist could be called a professional journalist, but many of these other occupations clearly don't have a code of ethics. Uh, lastly, the uh, number six, altruistic service to others, I think really clinches it for engineering and the other professions. Altruism is an old word. We don't use it too often, but it means the belief in or practice of selfless concern for the well-being of others. We call it public safety, uh, protection of the public. That's our primary goal, our number one goal when we sit down to do our professional practice. Uh, it's to make sure that we protect society, protect public against injury, loss of life, environmental degradation, economic losses. Go down the list. We're here to try and uh, make the best society possible for everyone. Uh, yet, if you try to apply that to an NHL hockey player, uh, are they really concerned about the selfless concern for the well-being of the fan? Well, a hockey player gets paid whether the, they win or lose, uh, whether they have a good game, whether the fans go home happy, or whether the fans go home uh, angry. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say uh, with some of the labor disputes I've seen among athletes, uh, high-level athletes, uh, I'm going to say they don't really care about the public at the end of the day. They're really uh, motivated by self-interest. Um, I'm not saying that to criticize them or to uh, slag them at all. But uh, I think the high-level athletes lose the right or lose the privilege to use the word professional because they don't have number five and number six so much. Uh, you might say that the rule book in, in uh, NHL hockey or, or – uh, uh, baseball, football, the rule book might be considered a code of ethics, but that's a bit of a stretch. So how did your person do? Did they make it through? Are they really considered a professional? Did they get all six? Because if they did, then, then I'll concede that maybe that occupation can truly use the word professional. Certainly engineering, uh, law, medicine, accounting, architecture, all the professions. We have 31 regulated professions in Manitoba and uh, we have all six of these criteria checked. And so we can confidently go forward knowing that we are professionals. 
Okay, so let's pause for a moment. Uh, I hope that uh, so far we've made it clear as to what is a professional or not uh, and what is professionalism. Let's move along and look at some other qualities of professionalism and what professions are trying to do. I say to uh, our students, uh, when I lecture to the students, at all times, we wanna reflect society. If we're going to be good at serving society, we've gotta know what society looks like and we've got to fit in. Post-war Canada and the USA was a rebuilding time defined by shifting social values. Does the profession reflect or look like society today? Well, I know what it looked like in those post-war years. I was born in that time. And so I, I know what uh, society looked like as I was growing up. And I can tell you that in my youth, society seemed more homogeneous. It all kind of looked the same. On my street where I lived, we all looked the same. There weren't a lot of differences. And forgive me uh, if anyone's offended by this, but uh, I, I, I call it, uh, kind of the white bread culture, kids who grew up in the suburbs. Uh, uh, I admit that was my life. I'm very thankful for, for a good upbringing, but we all look the same. However, today, Canadian society is more diverse and defined by, by things that uh, weren't so obvious back in, in, in my youth. Uh, our profession needs to check itself. Do we look like society today? Society is defined more by things like gender. Gender equality or inequality is a topic that's being discussed today. Ethnicity. Society is defined by beliefs, different beliefs, religious beliefs, political beliefs, moral beliefs, all kinds. These things are being discussed regularly every day in today's society. Not so much back then. Attitudes, society is defined by attitudes and, and we see many. Uh, I'm a news junkie. I, I watch the news on, online and on television, uh, on my device. I'm a news junkie. There's lots of attitudes about economics, the environment and different social trends. So I think our profession, uh, the profession of engineering needs to pay attention to that and to ensure that we're not falling behind. And I would like to ask you, does our profession include men and women? Engineers, geoscientists, Manitoba is working hard on that particular thing. We want to see greater gender equality in the engineering profession. What about Indigenous engineers? Do we have enough? We track that in here in Manitoba, and we have less than 1% of our register are Indigenous engineers. We're hoping to see that increase. What about international engineers? Well, that's easy. Engineers have been moving around the world probably four and five decades now. My father was an engineer and he hired many engineers in the early 50s and 60s. And these engineers primarily were from India and China and they came to Manitoba to practice engineering. So we got lots of international engineers. We're an international profession. But what about LGBTQ persons? Do we have them well represented in our profession? We need to think about that because society is very different today than it was when I was a small uh, child. And so I always say to my children, look, I'm just trying to keep up. And I wanna to say to all of you as engineering professionals, let's all try and help each other to keep up. At all times, we wanna reflect society. Now, this is a question that, uh, uh, is sometimes confused among uh, engineers and among professionals in general. Does anyone own the profession? I'm talking about a, a moral ownership versus a legal one. A moral ownership is based on values of right and wrong and the su subject to change. You know, uh, how we view things can change quickly with public opinion. Legal ownership is defined by the laws of the land and are slower to change. So we have to make sure that, that we keep up with attitudes about right and wrong and professional practice fits into that. 
The public at times will say, what are you engineers doing? We don't like what you're doing, or we want you to do more of this, but not more of that. And so there's a kind of a moral ownership. The public actually has a right to tell us how to do our engineering. And that's defined in this new term that is emerging. How many of you have heard of this term, social license to operate? Uh, you need to be aware of it. You may have a license to practice engineering, but do you have society's approval to practice? I'll give you an example. If uh, you show up at your work site, it might be a construction site, it might be a research lab, it might be a manufacturing facility, it could be a uh, information technology shop with rooms full of uh, computer IT people. But if you show up there and there's a protest at the front door, or if someone's chained themselves to the gate of your construction site, do you have their social license to operate? Well, the answer is no. So we need to respect this and at all times do good, good uh, stakeholder engagement with those we serve. It may be more obvious to some who, who are building pipelines or transmission lines or, or are going to do land development of a certain type. Those things get lots of attention. Uh, some of us practice in areas that are, are uh, almost unknown to the general public and so don't have any uh, controversy attached, but the acronym NIMBY comes to mind. Not in my backyard. If the public responds with this attitude, we don't have their approval to do our professional practice. So let's be mindful of this as we move forward in our practice. I think you're familiar with this. Uh, we're a self-regulating body, us engineers, particularly in Canada, we enjoy the privilege of self-regulation. And uh, you might ask yourself, well, what makes a profession a self-regulating body? Well, it's controlling who gets in. And, and we don't do this to be an exclusive club. No, 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 we want to be inclusive. I was just saying that a few slides ago. We want to include all people, including the general public, into our professional practice. But we do have to make sure that everybody's got the right standard of education. We wanna know that they've got good professional practice. We wanna know that they're keeping up, that they're not falling behind it. So they gotta do some CPD. And then of course, at all times, we wanna be of good character. Uh, we don't wanna get arrested for anything. Uh, we don't wanna get to criticized um, um, because we have bad character. So these things we have to ensure and we do that uh, for ourselves in a self-regulating model, uh, which we enjoy here in Canada. If we keep doing a good job of self-regulation, then we'll enjoy this privilege. If we ever do a bad job and the public doesn't like it, uh, the governments across the land will change their mind about self-regulation and they'll impose government-controlled regulation. That's what is happening actually, uh, or, they have government controlled regulation in the US and uh, UK parts of Europe. It's not self regulated. There are some interesting things about our professional practice here in Canada. And uh, um, just wanna, you know, if, if anyone uh, is not aware, I think many of you will be, but we have the right to practice because it's enshrined in the Canada Act of 1982. Uh, if you're about my age, you'll remember Her Majesty and Prime Minister Trudeau version one signing the Canadian Constitution in 1982. I remember it was a wonderful historic day. Um, and, and so, uh, but the professions get their legal authority from the Canada Act. It flows into a provincial piece of legislation. Uh, you all have them in your various uh, provinces across Canada. We have the Engineering and Geoscientific Professions Act of Manitoba here, and uh, it gives us the right to associate and govern ourselves through an association like Engineers and Geoscientists Manitoba. Our profession, uh, I refer to the ABCs. We're not going to dwell too long on this because uh, this is a little bit different in each province and, and even in other countries of the world. Uh, but it refers to the triplet I call the ABCs. Uh, in engineering practice, we have legislation called the Act. 
We have our local bylaws, which we must abide by as members of uh, our uh, regulatory body. And of course, code of ethics is quite common all across Canada, uh, some minor differences, but at all times we want to uphold good conduct through our code of ethics. Here's just an important section from our legislation in Manitoba. It's the purposes section. I encourage you wherever you are to look this up in your governing legislation. It specifically lays out what our association can do uh, through our, our uh, existence and through our members. And so it's very specific. We, we must do this. We can't do beyond this and we can't actually do less than this. We must hit that sweet spot of fulfilling all of these five requirements in the purposes section of our legislation. We have our bylaws, of course, we have our code of ethics. In Manitoba, we just newly revised the code of ethics. This is more consistent with the model given by Engineers Canada. And uh, so I think many regulators across Canada use this uh, particular code, very simple, straightforward, eight statements about how we should conduct ourselves uh, as professionals. Did you know that your license gives you the right to call yourself an engineer? Without that license, you actually can't legally call yourself an engineer. Some people get into trouble doing that, but our legislation and our bylaws give us a right to title and a right to practice. And this is very, very special because uh, not uh, many occupations have a right to, to exclusive practice. The professions do have exclusive right. So let's move to some other tenets or some other attributes of professionalism. In the engineering profession, we have a professional seal. And when we put that seal on our documents, we're showing to the public and ultimately to the world, anyone who views our work, that we are a professional. This is being done in digital format, a highly encrypted secure format today uh, in the form of a digital seal, but we still give every professional member in Manitoba the old fashioned rubber seal, uh, although many, many uh, don't use it uh, on paper anymore. Uh, it's a token of professionalism that they uh, appreciate getting. Also another tenet of professionalism is good mentoring. I know I've enjoyed good mentoring uh, throughout my career. I even still am mentored by, by uh, a number of engineers that I really appreciate their influence in my life. Um, but a good mentoring is a quality of most professions, uh, some better than others, but I'm proud to say that the engineering profession does a really good job of this. And uh, it's one of our qualities of professionalism. I said a few slides back that it was important that we keep up that if we're going to help society as best we can, we got, we got to keep up with our technology, with our methodologies and our professional practice. In Manitoba, we have a program called ProDev and it's a required continuing professional development program for all of our members. And uh, you likely have something similar to that in your region as well. And now I'm kind of stretching it a little bit. This is maybe not a common quality of professionalism. But in Manitoba, we got a slogan. And I'll even say a year free to share and use this slogan, but I think this one nails it for engineers. My life's work makes life work better. My life's work makes life work better. I think that's a statement of professionalism. We also have an ad campaign all over uh, Winnipeg. We put up uh, billboards, uh, we put banners on the back of transit buses at transit stops. Uh, we do it at the uh, trailers at the uh, Silver City uh, Cinema, albeit nobody's going to movies these days right now. But we want to let the public know that an engineer was here. We put these uh, signs on elevators, uh, on different uh, buildings and things where engineers have had great influence. We want to let the public know that we're here. We also do it for geoscientists as well. We have an, a geoscientist was here banner. Have a look at these videos if you get a chance. Uh, I think you'll find them inspiring. These are all 
true life stories of engineers here in Manitoba. I'm sure you have similar stories in your part of the country uh, with your colleagues, but uh, go have a look at my story on our website and you'll see some top quality professionals telling their personal stories. So I kept on my timeline. We've got lots of time for questions and answers. I see the chat is going by. I'm gonna ask Jim to help us out with that. But firstly, uh, as we, before we go to questions and answers, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who supported National Engineering Month. You can see the different organizations on your screen. Uh, I just wanna send out a big shout out to these ones. Uh, and thanks so much for your support of National Engineering Month. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. I understand that lectures like this one, uh, I think there's about 70 available this month that you can come online and view. And as we're at the last day of the month, uh, maybe you'll have to uh, uh, look at the videos uh, or the recordings uh, because the month is over. But thanks to our partners, um, we, uh, we've really enjoyed a good month of sharing engineering with all of Canada. So we're at the end. Um, I always say you can ask Grant anything. <laughs> I'll do my best to answer. And uh, there's my email address. If you had a private question that uh, maybe you want to send to me privately, I'll, uh, I'll do some of those as well. Uh, but Gemma, I'm going to turn it back to you. Uh, please help me with some of those questions in the chat uh, box. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Grant. Thanks for such a great presentation and perfectly on time as well. Well done. Um, so like Grant said, if you have any questions, uh, do feel free to type them into the chat box and uh, I will be reading them out so that Grant can reply. So we do have a couple coming in already, Grant. So a question from Christopher. Um, could you maybe touch upon what happened with Microsoft and their use of the term engineer for their certification program a few years ago? Uh, thanks for your question, Christopher. That's a good one because it was a landmark ruling in Canada. I'm losing track of the time now. I'm going to say it was about 20 to 25 years ago. You can look this up. I'm sure there's web pages on the internet describing what took place. But at that time, I'm going to say about the early 90s, Microsoft Corporation came out with a training program called the Microsoft Certified Network Engineer or Systems Engineer, I think it was. Uh, there was two actually. Uh, I did some training courses in that program. I was an engineer at the time, but, but uh, they used and promoted, and you know, Microsoft is big. They, they used the word engineering and the Order des Ingenieurs de Québec took exception to that and took them to court and said, you do not have a legal right to, to use that term because these people studying in this program are not engineers. Some were, but uh, anyone could sign up. Uh, yeah, I think you had to have a high school graduation to sign up for one of Microsoft's courses. And, uh, and yet if you completed their courses, they would call you, they'd send you a certificate calling yourself a Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer. It went to court, uh, Microsoft uh, defended themselves vigorously. However, the law was upheld and the judge ruled against Microsoft. It went to the Quebec Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal upheld the de decision of the lower court. And so at that time, Microsoft stopped using that term in Canada and it was a legal precedent uh, setting day and all of our lawyers, so we work with lots of them, when we defend the use of the term engineer or the title professional engineer, or when we enforce against persons who are not properly licensed to use that name or that term, uh, that designation, uh, we point to Microsoft. And uh, though we've not had to take anyone to court, uh, we were in court uh, one time, uh, in court recently, there was a time in 2005 where we enforced against an individual who was not an engineer, not properly licensed, yet was using that term and advertising that on their uh, business website. So we were successful, but uh, the judge didn't have to look very far uh, because of uh, the ruling out of Quebec. So we can thank our colleagues in Quebec for that one. It's a, a, a legal precedent. And Christopher, thanks so much for your question. That's a, yeah, that's a really great, uh, great example there, Christopher. Thank you. Um, a question from David. 
This is an interesting one. So Grant, where do we stand on historical wrongs? Professionals had best interests at the time and were correct to the standards and practices of the time, but historically may have turned out to be the wrong decision. For example, flooding lands for hydroelectric power generation. Um, are our engineering fathers and grandfathers heroes or villains? And even worse, will we become villains as we move forward in our career? Uh, David, thank you for your question. I can answer that question personally. Uh, my father was an engineer. He served his whole career for Manitoba Hydro. As a small boy, I lived at Grand Rapids, Manitoba. And if any of you know uh, the province of Manitoba, there's a, one of the large hydroelectric power dams in the Manitoba Hydro system was built at Grand Rapids and I lived there as a small boy. My dad was an engineer. So I got skin in the game on this one. And uh, uh, thank you for the question. It's one we're wrestling with today. Uh, I've met Ovid Mercury, uh, former National Grand Chief, and he is from Grand Rapids First Nation. And uh, he remembered my father because my father hired Ovid and his relatives they became trained technicians uh, in their youth as high schoolers. And uh, so Ovid remembered my father, but I ple have pledged to him that I will do my best for reconciliation of the wrongs done to the Grand Rapids First Nation. Now, we can't see that hydro dam moved. It's there. It is what it is. However, my pledge to him and to all uh, Indigenous and First Nations people is to do better going forward. You ask the question, will we possibly become villains in the future? Well, I suppose that's possible. I never say never. I still hope it doesn't happen. But in the example uh, given about land development, hydroelectric development, we can see that we went in and uh, did some things which were terrible. We didn't know what we were doing. Here's a simple example. Grand Rapids First Nation at the time was a population of about 800 people. Um, let's just say half were men, half were women. Of the half that were women, oh, about a third were young girls and children. What do you think happens to a community when 2,000 men show up in a work camp and live there for about a 10 year period? What do you think happens to those young girls and women? I don't think I have to explain anything. You all know what happened. We didn't know the damage we were causing, the harms, the hurts, but now we know. So when we go into these places to do a land development, we do it in partnership with First Nations and the Indigenous people. Uh, we have a, a, a new hydroelectric dam in Northern Manitoba where that was done, where the First Nations actually own a third of the, the uh, uh, project. They will uh, gain economic benefits from it jobs and uh, hopefully some security and they were included from the beginning uh, and so we can address things like social impact environmental impact economic impact and we're called upon as engineering professionals to to uh, pay respect to those things but also to do to fulfill them as best we can going forward so uh, i regret that uh, uh, my father always said uh, he, he was one of the few people to go up Grand Rapids before the dam was there in a freighter canoe uh, piloted by an indigenous man who's uh, still alive today. He's way up in his 80s. Uh, shout out to Albert. Uh, but my dad said it was the most beautiful set of rapids he'd ever seen. And he regrets that they did not put downstream flow through the old rapids and through the old channel for historical and aesthetic purposes because apparently it was beautiful. And uh, so my father always uh, said that, he's passed on now, but it's my commitment as the next generation to do better in uh, this respect. And David, thanks so much for your question. Thank you. Okay, another question for you here, Grant. You kind of touched upon mentoring a little bit towards the end of your presentation, uh, but especially for anyone that's perhaps newer to uh, the profession, um, can you kind of touch a little bit more on what makes a good mentor? And if you're willing to share, um, if you have any stories about um, who shaped your career and any mentors that kind of guided your path in engineering. 
Yeah, uh, good mentoring is, um, I'll say, I'll start with just, it's a two-way street. It's mutual. It has to be. It's not, I'm the senior professional. I know lots of stuff. I'm going to impart this to you, a junior professional. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, both parties, if it's two of you, uh, I, actually, I recommend mentoring uh, in a breakfast format. I know restrictions and things. Uh, we can't just easily go to restaurants uh, and sit down and have breakfast or lunch together. But uh, when we get back there, I recommend four professionals, a new grad, a junior, someone who's maybe been out five or so years, a mid-career professional, 10 to 20, and a senior professional, if you can find four like that, meet for breakfast. But it's got to be mutual. Each individual in the mentoring relationship has to understand that they're there to learn something. And uh, I, I said earlier, I tell my kids, look, I'm just trying to keep up. It's hard to keep up because terminology changes quickly. Social trends change quickly. Technology changes quickly. How do you keep up? Well, I so enjoy speaking to students and young professionals. Their professional practice doesn't look at all like mine did when I graduated. They have the modern, up-to-date, current technology that we never had. So I better listen carefully. There's something to be learned. There's something to be learned about attitudes in today's environment where we practice. Listen to the younger professionals. They're going to tell you what the public's thinking. They're really a part of uh, popular culture, pop culture. So uh, it's got to be mutual. Another thing too is it's got to be intentional. Uh, if it's too random, kind of once in a while, let's get together for a coffee. Let's meet online once in a while. I would recommend that uh, with uh, if a person, uh, if you realize that there's an opportunity for mentoring, use the word. Say, hey, should we meet more regularly for this mentoring? I really appreciate, uh, I, I learn something from you each time we talk. So you could set a schedule and say, let's meet Wednesday at noon online for the next four weeks in a row to see what's going on. So make it intentional would be my next recommendation. A third one would be a focus on a topic. Uh, for the senior professional or the more senior professional, speaking to the more uh, the junior prof professional, say, what's going on at work? What's going good? What are you struggling with? Do you have a question? Uh, there are some questions that I had uh, early in my career that, uh, you know, I had the option of asking my dad, you know, it was always dad, you kind of had to take it with a grain of salt when it was your dad. <laughs> but dad gave me some good advice. But I did get good advice from other uh, engineers. And you gotta, gotta have courage, some of you younger professionals, swallow hard, take a deep breath, have courage to ask the tough question. Uh, you're going to get a good answer. And you're going to get an answer from a person who's informed because they've lived through many, many days of professional practice. Uh, lastly, um, I, uh, this is a bit of self-interest in this comment. Uh, don't be too hard on us old guys. Uh, we got uh, some snow on the rooftop. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and, and sometimes, I, I, I confess, uh, at earlier times of my career, I did not show respect to those uh, older engineers. I take it all back. Wow, they've lived a life. I've met a few engineers that made it up to the uh, 95, 96, 101, 102. And if they're going to tell you a story, just listen carefully. They're going to tell you a wonderful story, but you got to translate. Sometimes I talk in old language, old terms. You got to translate, but ask questions. Uh, I wish you well with any mentoring opportunities you have. It's wonderful. Uh, I promise if I get a chance to ever sit with uh, any of you, I'll do my best to listen. Uh, and I won't say, uh, I'll never use the phrase, the good old days. Everyone, the good old days are now. Let's go forward and uh, enjoy our professional practice now. Don't live in the past. We can't live too far in the future. No one knows what tomorrow brings, but let's enjoy professional practice today. Excellent, thank you so much, Brent. Uh, we just had a quick question from David and actually I can answer this one, David. Uh, he was just asking, is there a mentoring program? Currently the mentoring program that exists within Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba is specifically uh, for women that are just entering the professions. Um, however, it is something that we are looking into based on feedback from our members. So stay tuned uh, for upcoming news. <laughs> um, and once again, Grant, I just wanna say thank you so much. We are one minute uh, to the end of our session. So we're perfectly on time and I know 
everyone's time is very valuable. So before everyone leaves, I just want to host a quick poll on the screen. So please stay tuned. Uh, the poll is now launched. So this is just some feedback for NEM Ontario about this particular session. Uh, so we do want to know what you think. Um, check any that apply. You can check more than one if more than one is applicable for you. Uh, so let us know what you thought about this session. Did you learn or deepen some existing knowledge or did you get some new values from it? Um, was the learning that you undertook today, will it be helpful moving forward either within your organization or your community? Um, and would you attend another online NEM Ontario event? Uh, that's something that they want to know as well. So as Grant mentioned, this is actually the very last session for National Engineering Month, though, which is March. We're at the end of National Engineering Month today. Um, so this will be the last session. However, as I said at the beginning, all of the sessions have been recorded and will be featured on NEM Ontario's YouTube channel moving forward. So do go check that out. You can revisit Grant's presentation as well as all of the presentations that have taken place this month. I'm just gonna close this poll right now. I'm gonna give you five more seconds for the eight of you that haven't voted. Four, three, two, one. Thank you so much for those of you that voted. Um, and I just want to say again, Grant, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for presenting today. Um, and Sarah Bradshaw, she's not here right now, but Sarah Bradshaw from NEM Ontario, thank you so much. She's been coordinating all of these sessions of which Grant is the culmination, the final session. Um, and to, to everyone that's watching, I'd like to say on behalf of NEM Ontario, our presenter Grant Koropatnik, myself and everyone here at Engineers Geoscience Manitoba, I just like to wish you a happy National Engineering Month. Thank you once again all for attending and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.